Hey, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for, uh, for being here. It's a pleasure to be here and to close out this, uh, this conference. It, it is so amazing to see so many students in one room that are very curious about tech and, and machine learning and, and reinforcement learning. When I graduated and entered industry, there were two jobs available to me. I could go into insurance or go into startup. Insurance being like I'm predicting you know, premiums for people, not the most exciting. So I chose my own path. I'm going to go down music, go into music technology. And uh, there's not a lot of people in Edmonton that do it. In fact, I may be the only one. Uh, there's not too many people in Canada that do it. Um, so it's really exciting. It's, it's super exciting to see everyone, everyone here today, um, mostly because we're in the most exciting age of technology as, as humankind. It's really, really cool. Think about it. So we have the Bronze Age, super lame. We have the Iron Age, lame, a little bit better than Bronze Age. And then we have the Middle Ages. And not too much happened for technological advancement there. Basically, we focused on swords and armor and killing people. Not too much happened. And then we get into the Industrial Age. And then we're moving from cottage industry to mass production, the age of globalization. We're taking all those products that we're making, we're sharing them with the world. That's really, really exciting. And then we're getting into the information age, the digital age, the invention of the internet, Tim Berners-Lee creating the World Wide Web, the information superhighway. Everything in the 90s was super. That's why we have Super Nintendo, Super Mario. Um, after that, now we're in the age of data, big data. Why is it big? Because there's so much of it. It's really, really exciting. Uh, and that's why I'm excited to see so many people in these chairs that are very curious about, about data and big data. Machine learning and reinforcement learning is permeating every industry, every vertical. All the products that we use use machine learning, reinforcement learning in some way in the product chain. Even at my house, I have a Google Home, and I use it for playing music to myself. Um, but it's also listening to everything that I'm saying. On YouTube, when I'm coughing and I'm sick, I'm getting served ads for Robitussin. A little invasive. I don't really like that too much. But that's the way it is. There's never been so much data in our world that we're, we're parsing. We're making predictions on it. We're trying to understand things better. And really, in every single industry and vertical, and it's really, really exciting. Um, so the purpose of this keynote is going to be looking at one slice, one, one vertical. So I'm in the music industry. We're going to talk about music. Uh, we're going to make some music today, which is going to be pretty fun. And uh, talk about the ramifications of AI entering into a creative world, which is really cool. Uh, so I, myself. I'll go a little bit of lineage about how I got to where I am uh, in case anybody wants to follow in my footsteps and go down into music technology. Um, <clears throat> I'm a musician myself. That's me on the left. And that's my kid on the right. And he's learning to play guitar much better looking than I am. And uh, that's me in the middle there, big long hair, uh, playing in rock bands um, back in college. Um, Primarily, though, I am a technologist. I'm really passionate about music. I love making music. Um, I play guitar, drums, bass, vocals, uh, pretty much anything in a, in a rock band. Um, and what, what a perfect way to, to marry that um, with technology. Um, so it was back in, in, um, in college. Uh, I was in a band, and my guitar player moved away. And we were still writing guitar riffs back and forth. I'd write a riff. I'd record it, send over the MP3 file to him. He would then take that MP3 file, figure out how to play it on his guitar, and then send it back to me, and we go back and forth. And it really sucked. It was not a good way to share information, to share that data. We need both the end product and we need the recipe to make that product so that we can go back and forth and be creative with each other remotely. So that was really the, the foundation of, of why I started Fredible. So I realized I needed a bunch, more <laughs> a bunch more knowledge to do that. 
So I did my Bachelor of Science in Computing Science at U of A. Um, and then I looked around in Canada, where do I get that? And I also looked in the States, but the States was crazy for education. Um, and I didn't want to burden myself with that much debt. So looking around in Canada, there's two places that you can do what I do. One in uh, University of Victoria, one at McGill. Uh, so I went to McGill and did a, a Master of Arts in Music Technology. And that was um, very much machine learning applied to music. Um, then I came back to, to U of A, and I did a Master of Science uh, in Computing Science uh, with their uh, statistical machine learning program, uh, and really dug into uh, data and statistics and, and the mathematics behind it. And then I worked in industry for a little bit, um, and then I found it Fredible. So at Fredible, what we do is essentially we're music technology applying machine learning to music. So it's, it's audio data. We're making time series predictions uh, on the audio data itself. And uh, our first product takes audio recordings of someone playing piano, guitar, uh, whatever, and converting it to sheet music and MIDI that they can then share with other musicians. OK, so let's say that I'm an artist and I'm, and I'm interested in creating music. Uh, specifically lo-fi. I'm really into lo-fi lately. I've been listening to a bunch of lo-fi. So let's say I'm on YouTube, and uh, I found a, a cool cover of, in this case, a Mandalorian. So let's say that I then wanted to take that, and let's say that I wanted the actual musical data from that. Like, what notes are occurring every single time of that performance? And I want to bring that back into my digital audio workstation so that I can move around notes, tweak stuff, make new stuff, make new songs out of it. Um, that's what Fredible does. So on the very, very top, you'll see the original YouTube video of the person playing the piano. And on the bottom, you'll see the, it's called MIDI. It's a MIDI transcription. It's all the individual notes. I'll skip forward to a little part. So that's a much cooler way to display that data rather than just audio waveform. And it allows us to actually make music out of it. So if I go check out the Fredible page, you can see the original audio up top here. You can listen to it. You can also check out the sheet music for it. So anyone that, that knows how to read sheet music could then play this on piano. And you can also take that MIDI file. So this is what was shown in the video there, right here. And then you can download that MIDI file. And so let's say, back to my lo-fi example. Let's say I'm a lo-fi artist, and I want to take a, a cover song. And um, oh, this is me actually playing around with it here. We're going to do this right now, though. OK, so this is the. This is the MIDI file right here. Um, so I brought it into GarageBand. GarageBand is just a digital audio workstation where you can make music and, and stuff like that. Um, so here's all the individual notes that were played. So this is all the output from Fredible, uh, from the machine learning. Um, so you can go in here. You can, uh, you can move around notes, move stuff around. You can change. So let's say that you wanted to change the actual instrument. So you could go to orchestral, brass, French horns, 
and see what Mandalorian sounds with, like with French horns. It's actually pretty creepy, that's kind of cool. <laughs> okay, so let's say that I was gonna take um, the original piano, so let's make it sound like a piano. So this is, uh, this is what it was before. So this is all the actual MIDI, so I'm not, I'm not playing the original audio, it's all synthesized from, from the actual note data that we extracted. So let's say I wanted to make it kind of lo-fi-y. Um, so I go into keyboards, and let's find a keyboard that we like. Okay, this one's cool. So, let's find a part of the song that we really like and we'll kind of work off of that. Let's look, let's see, maybe in here somewhere. That sounds pretty cool. Okay, so lo-fi always has like a vinyl scratch sound in the background. That's kind of what makes it lo-fi. So we can grab in some lo-fi scratch. Put that in there, and we'll just loop it over top in the back. Cool. Sounding a little bit more lo-fi. Does anyone listen to lo-fi music here? Show of hands. Oh my god, amazing. Ah, oh, okay, cool. Well, this is gonna be very cool then. Okay. So we're starting to sound a little bit more lo-fi, right? Okay, so now we need a drum beat, right? Let's go, let's go look for some loops. Search for lo-fi here. Let's put it right here. Let's see what it sounds like. All right. I bet it sounds amazing. It's in the wrong tempo. Let's try again. to be done. But you can see how like, adding in all these different components uh, based off of that, you can change instruments. It's a much more fruitful way to actually move around music and, and put loops over everything. Very, very cool. All right. So let's hop back here. OK, so think about that product. That's more for music creation. Now let's think about uh, music education, music instruction. Uh, so think about in the pandemic. Um, everyone's kind of holed in, you might have a guitar in the back corner and you want to kind of pick it up. You don't have access to your traditional brick and mortar, mom and pop shop where you can go for lessons. Um, you're kind of holed in. Uh, so really, online learning became such a, such a massive vertical um, in the pandemic. Uh, and we have the tech to listen to people play, so why not listen to them play, give them feedback, um, as they're playing and, and offer them a whole platform where they can learn guitar, for example. So who, who here has played, uh, say, Guitar Hero? Yes. Who here has played Rock Band? A little less. Who here has played Rock Smith? My man. My man. Okay, three people. Okay. So this is essentially, this product is like Rock Smith which is like Guitar Hero, but with a real guitar. It's listening to you play, but also with instructional videos and, and a full learning platform on top of that. Um, so essentially, 
tabs fly across the screen like that, and you're playing along with, with songs uh, that you love, uh, and it'll light up red or green and let you know, like, hey, you're a fret too high, a fret too low, a string too high, a string too low, that kind of stuff. This is me this morning. We used to leave the blue lights And the ones and the ones Ever since you had the So really, the only change there in the listening technology is it has to be real time, which is definitely a technical hurdle. Um, and, and really, that was the only thing that, it, that we had to pivot the actual core technology to be able to produce a product like this. Um, so we produced that really quick in the pandemic and, and got that out to people, which was a really, really fun project. So how does it work? Um, we have digital signal processing. Uh, so digital signal processing would be taking the audio stream, creating features for it for machine learning. Uh, we use deep learning, recurrent neural networks, um, and then a layer on top of that of conditional random fields, and neural networks, uh, which is kind of de facto standard these days. A lot of people are using neural nets. OK, so now I want to talk about the disruption of AI machine learning, reinforcement learning in industry, and specifically my industry in music technology. Um, this contraption right here is called a hexaphonic pickup. Hex, six, six strings on a guitar. And usually on a guitar, this right here, this plug, combines all of the little pickups for all the strings into one output and gives you one audio signal. A hexaphonic pickup is a whole separate pickup that Customers will buy and install on their guitar. You can actually see it underneath his palm there. They have to install this piece underneath their guitar, and then it hooks up to this whole contraption on the side that has a whole separate cable that comes out here, and it comes in here, and this whole setup is $1,200. And what it does is it listens to you play your guitar, and you can synthesize your guitar as a piano, you can synthesize it as a sitar, or you know, whatever. Um, it's actually really cool, but it's also 1200 bucks. And what guitar players do you know that have 1200 bucks kicking around? Mostly old guitar players. Um, we're going to skip that guy. Um, so really, think about this. You're, you're using machine learning, reinforcement learning, to disrupt this whole product. So you're saying to the consumer, I don't, you don't need to purchase a $1,200 pedal and a whole pickup that you need to install. Um, I have an app that will just listen to you play, and I'll shoot out the MIDI notes for you. Um, so that's what we did. So now at the bottom of the app, you'll see all the individual notes that I'm playing, uh, along with all the probabilities that it hears those notes. So this is cool. This is running on an iPhone. So the whole neural network is running in TensorFlow, just chilling on an iPhone. And yeah, your iPhone is expensive. Sure, it's like 1,200 bucks. <laughs> but 
the technology that runs on it can be very, very cheap. And you don't have to install a bunch of stuff on your guitar, which is great. OK, so the next thing I want to talk about uh, in my journey is what I'll call the great data scarcity conundrum. So usually in, in academia, you get a project to work on or an assignment, and the prof or the TAs give you a bunch of data. Like, for example, the MNIST data set, which is postal code record, or zip code recognition in the States, right? You have this whole data set. You train some models, you get the results, and then you kind of wash your hands of it and you're done, right? So usually data is provided to you. And oftentimes in, in academia, um, what you work on is constituted by what data you have available to you, OK? So think about me. It's 2016. I'm young Greg, right? Um, I want to I wanna create this product. What's the first thing that I need? Yeah, amazing. We need data. <laughs> yeah, contextual clues, perfect. You need data, right? So where do I go for data? What's the first thing that you would do? You're starting a company, you need data. What do you do? Let's say that I'm, I'm doing, like, uh, piano. Start playing myself. OK, is it scalable? It's not scalable. Also, I'm not that great of a piano player. So in terms of like the complexity of pieces that I could play for training data, eh, maybe not so great. I can play a good Rick roll, though, on piano. Don't get me wrong. So then what do you do? Maybe you look in Google. Maybe, maybe someone has made a bunch of data sets already. Right? You go look around. Go see what you can find. For piano, yeah, there's some stuff out there. It was great. For guitar, <laughs> nothing. Nothing. So then what do you do? So I spent two years of my life. I founded the startup in 2016. We didn't have a product until mid-2018. I was sleeping on studio floors, uh, hiring guitarists from Craigslist. And uh, it's giving me the shivers just remembering it. Oh, it was awful. It was, it was literally hurting cats. And like musicians are the worst because they never show up on time. They're usually high. <laughs> and usually they only know one thing. Like, so, OK, you get the guitarist who is uh, the Led Zepp guitarist. Cool. You get the guy who's the Beatles guitarist. Cool. You get him in. Um, but you have to represent a really broad array of data, right? It's blind transcription. You have no idea what customers are going to play into your product. You have to represent jazz. You have to represent all these different genres, right? Um, so it's really, really tough. Um, so for piano, OK, first, actually, this is a really funny story. Um, there's a rock band. Uh, like a rock slash metal band uh, in Germany that's all robots. So there's a robot guitar player. There's a robot drummer. Um, there's even a little robot that goes on the hi-hat stand and just bobs his head. That's all he does. Um, and I, tried, I reached out to them, and I, I, I tried to like, fly out to Germany just to go record these robots go play. That's how desperate I was for data. Uh, on the piano side, um, there's a lot of cool stuff that's out there. Have you guys ever been to a shopping mall? where they have a keyboard that's automatically playing. Yeah, so it's called a disc clavier. Um, so at the university, like deep in the bowels of the recording studios, they're like deep in the basement of the fine arts building, they have a bunch of these disc claviers. Um, so they would allow me to go in at night, and I'd bring a sleeping bag, and I would, I would sit there for, well, I'd sleep for eight hours, listen to this disc clavier play. This was it. Super cool. So that was eight hours a night, and I did that I don't even know how many times. Um, I'd like to say it was painful, but it was actually pretty great. You get pretty good music, and you're just feeding it MIDI. Um, so my point here with, with data scarcity conundrum is oftentimes you're not spoon-fed data, um, especially in industry. Um, and you have to be creative with, with ways to, uh, to get that data. And often it costs a lot of money. Um, and often it costs money and time. Like for me, it was two and a half years of my life, right? OK. The next thing I want to talk about is 
Has anyone heard the term white box models versus black box models? Has anyone heard that before? I see a lot of head nodding. OK. White, for those who don't, don't know, uh, a black box model would be like a neural network. Uh, it's a box. Think of like a bunch of neurons that are interconnected. And you give it input. It goes into the black box. It produces output. And then you get the output. But you can't really see how it's doing anything, much like our brains, right? Like we get audio input. It goes into this black box. And then it's interpreted. But we don't really know how it works, right? And a white bo box model is the opposite. So you give it uh, some sort of stimulus, some sort of input. Um, it makes decisions. And you can peer into those decisions and say, well, yeah, if the input is this, then we're going to do this. And if the input is that, then we'll do that. Um, typically in academia, you really don't care whether it's white box or black box. It's um, the best result for the paper that you're writing or your project, right? You just want to look the best that you can. Um, so you just try a bunch of different models and, and see, what, see what works, right? Um, in industry, it's really interesting. I ran into um, a couple situations, and I have a couple stories, um, where it really did matter. First being um, for sales, which is kind of weird that sales would even care about what machine learning model you're using, but they do. Because uh, let's say that you're talking to a client, and uh, they say, well, how does it work? There you go. Huh? I don't know. How does it work? You tell me. Do you think that the client is like particularly impressed that, that you don't even know how your product works? So it's actually really hard to explain. You're like, no, no, trust me, it's cool, it's cool. You're going to want this. It's really, really tough. And the second was I was consulting in oil and gas in, in the energy sector. And um, I, I said, let's try out a neural network. And the guy looked at me and he's like, we can't do that. There's no way we can do that. I said, well, why? He said, we don't know how it works. And we don't know what the output could be. Could it break all of our machines if it just starts going haywire? I'm like, well, that's not really how it works. But I could tell that, that it was already dead. Like, he wasn't going to accept it. Um, so it actually does matter what, what model that you select um, in industry um, for, for various reasons, which is kind of mind blowing. Because as a technologist, you just want to make the best thing possible. OK, academia versus industry. So typically for, uh, for machine learning, RL, it's kind of changing. But at least in the early days, it was kind of expected that you had a graduate level degree um, going into it. Um, but that's kind of changing with like various boot camps and Google uh, certificates that you can get for big data engineering and, and everything like that. Um, when I'm hiring people, looking at people's resumes, um, I'm looking for, like, obviously, are they musically oriented, which is important. Um, but just like how many product, projects that you've touched, like Kaggle competitions, if anyone's done a Kaggle competition before, um, super good to have um, just a list of, of all the things that you've tried and, um, and, and your results. And so I think that it definitely is changing, like it's changing. Um, in terms of, of uh, what kind of education that you need. Ooh. Oh, yeah, OK. So the other thing I wanted to say about this is, OK, in academia, uh, I, did, I did two grad degrees after that. It was four years. Um, what I didn't like about academia, and I'm not going to poo-poo academia, I think academia is, is, is great. Um, the thing that I don't like about it is you train all these models, you get the data, train the models, um, you write the paper, you do a bunch of revisions with your supervisor, and then you publish a paper, you fly out somewhere, which is awesome. Very much recommend uh, going to grad school if you want to go travel and eat good food. And then what happens to your project after that? So you've, you've wrote the paper, you go present it at a conference, and then it dies. It, it's called bit rot. Literally bits rotting in a GitHub repo. You just never touch it again, right? Whereas in, in industry, all the cool part you're missing out on, 
right? Like in, in industry, you then have to take that model that you've trained and put it up in a product somewhere. So whether that's on the cloud, you have to deploy it to AWS, um, improve your DevOps chops. You have to figure out how, how a machine learning model can service thousands of requests at a time. Super, super cool problems that you never get in, in academia. OK, so now, now we're getting into like the philosophical components of, uh, of creative AI, so AIs in creative spaces. So with creative AI, who owns what? So you, you've seen a lot of like general. I have a friend um, in Berlin who runs a generative music startup. So he, he creates uh, music for, for Twitch. So Twitch streamers use this service. Um, and the reason that they use it is because there's no copyright claims, right? So um, I know that T-Pain released like, his whole catalog for Twitch streamers, which is genius, super good. And Snoop Dogg was doing some of that too. And he's on Twitch, the Dragon Force guy. Uh, Herman Lee does that too. Um, but by and far, you're going to get copyright strikes if you're, if you're streaming on YouTube or Facebook. And, and there's a, actually a giant war going on right now. Um, so he's creating generative AIs that produce music. So taking, taking input from a video game that's being played and saying, like, what, what like, mood of music do I want right now? Right? Um, and then the question is, what are the parameters of that AI that's creating that music? So if it's like a recurrent neural network that's creating it, is it trained on a corpus of, of a certain type of music? Um, and, and then who, who owns that created music? Um, it's actually a really, really interesting uh, topic of conversation. Um, so we ran into a lot of issues with this with Fredable. So think about this. So someone comes to our our product, and they play in a guitar riff that they wrote, right? The, they send it off to us. Our machine learning analyzes it, writes the sheet music for them, and the MIDI file. And the copyright on the bottom says, copyright Fredable, 2022. How do you think that that makes artists feel? Like, what, you owned our music? Why do you own our music? I did all the hard work. Like, actually, our AI is pretty cool. It does a lot of hard work, too. But they don't care, right? So their overall sentiment is pitchforks and anger. Uh, and it's totally understandable. Like, it, it makes sense, right? So I went to my legal team, and I found someone that really knew music copyright and music law. And he said to me, look, Greg, here it is. And I'll remember this for the rest of my life, because it, it makes complete sense. So if you go into, uh, take a flight to Paris, you go to La Louvre, you go to the Mona Lisa, and then you snap a picture of it on your iPhone. Who owns that picture? I heard you. OK. So you own the picture, right? Do you own the Mona Lisa? No. Obviously, right? So there's a difference between copyright and intellectual property, right? So. Let's say that you hire a photographer, which we often do. We have weddings and events, and we hire a photographer. There's a photographer here right now. Um, you get a photographer. You hire a photographer to take a picture for you using their equipment. They take the picture. Um, who owns that picture? The photographer, right? Even though that you instigated the whole process. You hired the person to take the picture. You wanted the best picture possible. Um, usually what happens is then the photographer gives you a license to use that work if you want to print it off or you know, whatever, right? So now think about AIs, OK? So here's the deal. Someone creates a piece of music. They write a riff on guitar, for example. They then send it to a third-party service, us, right? And our AI uh, works on it, produces some output, and then they, the AI owns the copyright. And then the person who instigated the whole process says, why do you own it? I made it. It's really interesting. So the, the AI is not a, a person or an entity. It's just, I guess, owned by a company. And there starts getting these really weird gray areas um, that often are just nonsensical. It doesn't, doesn't really make sense. And AI and tech is like this. 
It's like it's equivalent to like the Middle Ages, arms and armament, right? We make like plate armor, right? And we go like, nothing can penetrate this plate armor. I'm a god. And then the next battle, someone shoots a gun at you. You're like, Frederick, this guy just shot a gun at me. And you're like, yeah. So then armor needs to improve, and then guns need to improve, and then armor needs to improve, and it goes back and forth. It's called the arms and armament battle, right? So think about that in terms of, of like AI and tech. Think about deep fakes, OK? The, the dude that made deep fakes, it was like probably a six-month ordeal, ate a bunch of Hot Pockets. <laughs> he's, like, he's a grad student. Um, and then created this thing that has such far ramifications for society. And literally, there's going to be, like, lawyers are probably pissed at this guy. It's going to be years of, of figuring out frameworks and restrictions and, and everything for, for like just that one technology, right? So it's this it's like arms and armament battle with, with tech. And us tech people, we move so fast. We can create things so quickly. We're really, really agile. And then legal stuff comes later. So in the music industry, there are so many gray areas of intellectual property law and copyright law, where it's like, what is an AI and, and who owns what? Super weird. OK, my first Rick roll. OK. So you guys know Elon Musk's company, uh, OpenAI? So he made, uh, well, he didn't make. His minions made Jukebox. Um, so this is an AI-generated uh, Rick roll right here. Like you're listening to Rick Astley, and you've had three whiskeys, and you're listening to him from the bathroom. You know, it's like, like you know, it's a song, but it's also not quite what you've heard before. Um, a lot of like generative music like that. I'm so sorry. To do it again. I'm so sorry to do it again. Okay, this is another cool one. Okay, so there's there's a bunch of YouTube streams that automatically generate music live, nonstop, 24/7. So this, uh, this startup from uh, Berlin, they paired with, with a hardcore screamo band called Silverstein. Anyone know Silverstein? Ha <laughs> ha, my man, my man. They created two albums. The first one had 1,000 songs on it. Second one also had 1,000 songs on it. And this is the result. There's a couple of riffs in there that really slap. They're really, really good. And, and the question is, like, to what extent are, is AI replacing musicians versus aiding them? So I, I could totally see myself as a guitarist looking at some of the riffs in those thousand songs and being like, bam, that's a song. Um, and using it as like an inspirational aid, like a muse almost, which is really cool. Um, and also like implications on, on digital artists. So have you guys seen like Dolly? And, and like, for example, that, um, that digital painting that won gold in that competition, which is crazy. And it's a beautiful, beautiful picture that was generated. Um, so this one is my, one of the bands I like called Emery. Um, they, he says, playing around with AI-generated art, made this from the cutthroat collapse lyrics, I can still feel the trees at my back and haunting me. And these were the, the images that were generated. It was like an album cover. Um, so previously, you'd have to go to Fiverr. You'd have to uh, commission some work to be created. Um, 
But the question is, like, who's going to do that work now? Um, so there's really some, some ramifications in terms of, of just us as humanity in creative, in creative spaces. Um, there's a lot of talk about like universal basic income, and if, if robots are going to do menial tasks for us, like moving bricks around for us, that then frees us up to have more time for other things. And kind of the one, per, the, the advocates of, of UBI, universal basic income, is great. Us as a humanity, we can focus on arts and culture. And technologies like this, I think, are a little scary because it really, it really squanders that, that, that kind of like end goal as humanity. Um, so definitely something to think of. Sorry to be so philosophical at the end. <laughs> Uh, just quickly, I want to mention uh, the charity partners, uh, Boyle Street uh, behind us, that's, that's um, to end chronic homeless, homelessness in our community. Um, and I believe that they're trying to actually construct a new community center, which is really cool. So if you have the means, um, please, please donate to that cause. And then also the, the United Way Alberta Capital Region Period Promise Campaign, which is cool. So um, please take a moment to, to learn about those charity partners and, uh, and contribute if, if you're able to. Um, so I'm going to end with this. Step one, find your passion. Think about this. Eight hours a day, or if you're in a startup, maybe like 12, you are working on something. Right? That's a long time. We sleep for eight hours a day. We work on things eight to 10 hours a day. And then you know, we do whatever else we do in our lives. That's a long time. So make sure that it's something that you're really passionate about. Don't just take a job because it's available to you. It's your life. And think about like, like money and, and, and all that kind of stuff. Core of personal happiness is working on something that you're really passionate about. So um, I, I implore you to do that. And uh, step two, this works for startups. It works for business. It works for anything. And this is advice when I uh, entered the workforce. This is what my dad told me. He said, become indispensable. Deliver what no one else can deliver. So if you're in a company and you're indispensable, who's going to fire you? Nobody. They're going to keep giving you raises. And same for startups. Think about your customers. Deliver something that no one else can. Right? And step three, profits. So thank you. That's all for me. Thanks.